Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the talk with my guest, Helen Creasy. Helen was born and raised in Oxfordshire, but has lived in Edinburgh since 1989. It was after completing a degree in the history of art at Manchester University that she had designs on being a conservator. After a year of volunteering with conservators working in a wide variety of disciplines, she found an affinity for paper. To forge a career, Helen then spent two years on a paper conservation course at Gateshead Technical College, ultimately graduating with a distinction. Helen secured her first post in her profession with the Victoria and Albert Museum, followed by a two-year fellowship at the Intermuseum Conservation Centre in Ohio. Returning to the UK, Helen moved into private practice in London with a renowned paper conservator, Philip Stevens. This was followed by a move to Edinburgh to set up a paper conservation service for what is now Museums Galleries Scotland. This involved working for museums all over Scotland, completing treatments, surveys and training in paper conservation. 2005 saw Helen along with her present business partners, Tula and Will, establish the Scottish Conservation Studio. The three work in separate disciplines, Helen in paper and photographs, Tula in fabrics and costumes, and Will in artefacts. Helen gained accreditation with the National Council for Conservation Restorations and attends professional training events to update her skills and knowledge. Helen also contributes to the health of her profession by hosting students, organising training and also social events. Outside of work, Helen enjoys a variety of craft activities, hill walking and is yet another speaker who enjoys working on an allotment. So, good evening Helen and uh, I'll basically just pass it over to you um, and we'll just make a start. Thank you. Um, so, Oops. Oh. Yeah, that. That. This. Okay. Um, right. Um, so, thank you for asking me to speak. Um, I'm going to give you a talk about what I do for a living. Um, uh, it's it's the sort of job that people seem to find interesting. We have visitors come to the studio and say, oh, if only I'd known about this, I would have liked to have trained as a. Um, so I'm giving you a little snippet so as you can see what it is that I do. Um, so as Neil said, um, uh, I work with two colleagues. There are three of us that, that run this business at the Scottish Conservation Studio. And we're based at Hopeton House, um, just across the water from you. Um, we're in the carriage house and we've been here um, for 16 years. Um, and uh, yeah, my colleagues are Tula, who's the textile conservator and Will, who's the artifacts conservator. Um, and uh, yeah, so but before we um, started working together here at the Scottish Conservation Studio, we all worked at the Scottish Museums Council. So we've actually worked together for a very long time, um, which which has been great. So I'm a paper conservator, and that means that I treat a whole variety of objects that are not just documents. I think some people initially just think that it's documents, but no. So I've written a list here of the sorts of things that I treat. So actually, primarily, I treat fine art on paper. So watercolours, prints and drawings are my everyday work. Um, then posters, maps and plans, letters, documents, miniatures, wallpaper, tracing paper, hibariums. You, you, you can read the book, the list for yourself. But what I don't treat 
are books, but it's a whole different training to become a book conservator. Um, I don't treat very large scale archive projects. I, I don't really have the facilities um, or indeed the inclination. Um, and I don't treat paintings that are oil paintings. So I do treat watercolor paintings, but not oil paintings that are on canvas or wood. So you might be thinking, what on earth can she do to keep herself busy with like what goes wrong? You wouldn't believe actually what goes wrong. All sorts of things can damage paper. And here again, I've not got very many slides that have got writing on them, but I thought it would be useful for you to have this at the beginning. Um, so a high temperature is not good for paper. High humidity is possibly one of the most damaging things that we see. Like damp conditions can cause mold and foxing. Um, exposure to light, uh, bright light and light over a long period of time causes damage. Fluctuating environment is not good. Air pollution, dust and dirt, water spills or drips or leaks. Um, that also accounts for quite a bit of my work. Um, poor quality mounts and frames, um, poor quality material that's been in direct contact with the paper for a long time. That also is a, is a big um, sort of uh, job creation scheme for me. Um, pests, obviously accidents, you know, people drop things, tear things, mark them by mistake. Wear and tear, people trying to mend things without knowing that in the end, sellotape is going to cause a big stain and, you know, horrible mark. Um, and then some things are inherently in state unstable. Um, you know, if, if it's very poor quality paper to start with, um, then that obviously is going to cause issues in the long run. I thought I'd put this up. Um, that it might be useful for you, um, maybe to come back to later, that if you have works of art on paper yourself, um, these are some top tips for keeping them safe. So always ask the framer to use the best quality mount board. So it's acid-free mount board um, for the window mount and the board that's behind the picture. So. Sometimes we see things with a nice posh window mount on the front and then there's no good piece of cardboard behind it and it goes directly against the hardboard and that's going to cause discoloration over time. Hang the picture frame very safely. So don't use string, um, it breaks, but use wire or brackets directly screwed in and you know the screws or nails into the wall need to be strong enough. Um, you can get uh, high quality glass, which filters UV. And for something that's really valuable, I, I would suggest that's a good idea because UV is the most damaging part of the light spectrum. Hang pictures that matter out of bright light. Um, obviously in a museum, the, the light is very controlled and pictures are only displayed for maybe a few months. But in your own home, you want to have these things hanging up and, and enjoy them, So, which I am totally in support of. But don't hang them in south facing windows, um, rooms with, you know, full of light. So choose, choose a, a dimly lit um, place in your home. Um, and something which, which I think is, is very useful for people who are hanging pictures on walls that are an outside wall, put little spaces behind the backs of the frames. Just what we use is, is a bottle cork, cut it into four rounds and stick those, literally stick them with like wood glue or something onto the back of the frame. So you get a bit of air circulation behind because the number of pictures that we see coming in that have been hanging on a damp wall, maybe just a tiny bit damp, but over the years, the dampness gets sucked up into the picture. There's glass over the front so it can't dry out. And so the, the hardboard and the mount board and the paper become really, really quite damp. And then you get 
foxing and mold. So those are my top tips. And now the rest of the talk, I'm really going to show you quite a lot of examples of works that I've treated. So before and after treatment pitches. So you can see just the sort of things that can be achieved, the sort of things that can go wrong. I'm going to give you hopefully quite a wide range of damages that have happened and a wide range of types of, of paper objects that, that I've worked on. So this is um, a little, quite small actually, um, a print, an etching by James McBay. It was on very lightweight paper and I hope you can see that it's covered in brown spots. That's foxing. And um, I, oops, uh, hang on. Oh dear, my thing won't advance. Um, ah, all of a sudden, my slide won't advance. Oh, there we go. Um, so the the one the picture behind is it before treatment and the picture in front is um, it after treatment. So this little print it, uh, was washed and light bleached. That means we use um, a lamp. So the the picture is immersed in an alkaline wash bath, uh, and then we shine a bright light on it, and uh, I was able to remove all the foxing. This again is a little picture that um, has foxing from being damp. It belonged to a private client um, who was actually a, a friend of Kalman, the cartoonist. Um, and this guy, David, was, he ran the anti-smoking group, Ash. Um, so Kalman drew this cartoon of him. And he was really quite distressed that, that he had allowed this picture to, to become so damaged when it mattered so much to him. Um, picture is drawn in oil pastel and that actually is very very stable in a wash bath so this is what I was able to achieve with that one um, it's I have to say it's, it's very gratifying to treat a little drawing like this which to me was quite a straightforward treatment the um, the owner really didn't have any expectation that I could do much with it and he was so pleased. It was, you know, it's really a treat for me to, to be able to do something like that for people and, and you know, really give them back what, what they loved. This is a pencil drawing and it's been damaged by light and by water. So I think the water stains are fairly obvious, um, but uh maybe what you wouldn't realize is that paper can go brown in long exposure to light so do you see the brown square that's the area that the window mount was exposing to light and the whiter area around the perimeter um was covered by the mount so it was in the dark um this one again um, was washed and light bleached and hey presto, it uh, came up pretty well. This one again, it was um, quite a, a nice um, sort of personal thing for the owner. It was her father who had drawn the picture, who actually became quite a well-known artist in Scottish art circles. Um, and, and they had a number of the sort of more damaged pictures at home because they hadn't been sold. So she was really, really chuffed to see this. And because I mentioned light damage, I thought these are not objects which have after treatment photos because unfortunately when something has faded, you really just can't bring that color back. But I thought you might like to see, um, these are a couple of watercolors which have been exposed to light and have faded quite dramatically. Um, so here, can you see where I'm pointing with the mouse? I hope you can, that this blue edge here of this watercolor had been covered by the mount. 
And in fact, two different mounds. So right here on the edge, this has been covered by both mounts, but this has been covered by one mount. Um, and and the, the picture still sort of holds up. It's quite a dramatic picture. You're obviously just seeing a little corner of it, but it makes you realize that it would have looked very, very different when it's first painted. This one is perhaps more interesting even. This picture at first sight doesn't look as if it's faded, but it had an oval mount on it. And the oval mount covered here, this bottom bit where the grass is, and the green pigment that was used to paint the grass was obviously very, very sensitive to light, whereas the other pigments in the picture were not sensitive. Um, so you do tend to get that, that not all pigments in watercolour painting, not all, you know, um, different, different inks will fade differently, different watercolours will fade differently. Some things are very, very stable um, and some things not stable at all. So, so you tend to get a sort of differential degradation. This actually is, is quite a favorite treatment of mine. Um, uh, a lady brought it in, she said, um, it's a pencil drawing of her mother when her mother was a child. The, um, and it, you know, she really, really cared about it. She had it in a frame and it was hanging on a wall in a flat that she wasn't living in. And there was um, a leak from a bathroom upstairs, which you know went on for a week or two. So the wall was very damp. And uh, when she come, came to the flat, the, this pencil drawing was covered in this very fine black mold, um, which she was really upset about. Um, so she brought it to the studio and I was able to say, it's okay, you've caught the mold very quickly. If you leave it for a long time, it's likely to get much worse. Um, but she'd caught it quickly. And so I was able to treat it. Um, I actually used something called a latex sponge um, and was able to just sort of literally dab it off. And then I asked if I could take the treatment a little bit further because the, um, the paper is quite discolored. It's had an acidic mount. And um, I knew I was really confident that, that I could make it look a lot better. Um, and again, she was so, so pleased with the result. It, it was really nice to be able to do that. Some things we don't get such a dramatic re good return on. Um, these actually are, uh, yeah, they're mold damaged archives from Abbotsford. We've done a lot of work for Abbotsford Trust. Um, and really all we could do to these were um, take the worst of the mold spores off, dry them out completely, flatten them and store them properly. So they, you know, they didn't look good as new at all after treatment. So it is limited. I'm not going to say that, you know, I can wave my magic wand over everything because absolutely not. If I'd washed this paper, it would have completely disintegrated. This is a curious little thing, a treatment that I did um, for Abbotsford. Um, this ball of paper had been stuffed into the toe of a leather boot of a soldier. Um, and they they discovered it when they were changing some displays and they they wanted to flatten it. It was hard as anything like really crispy so I was able to flatten it out for them and they could read what the document said. This isn't paper it's parchment so it's a certificate um, and again a sort of interesting client story here it's a quite an elderly gentleman brought it in and he said that the certificate had been granted to his father for an act of bravery. I think it's rescuing somebody from a icy pond. Um, and this man said that when he was a boy, he tipped the ink over the parchment certificate and created this damage. And he said, then his father just hid it in a drawer and you know, it was never displayed. So treating parchment is very, very different to treating paper. Parchment is skin. And obviously that means it has a very different structure and it responds very differently to, to the treatments that we can do. 
Um, so with this one, I, I couldn't use water. You can't wash skin parchment. Um, so what we had to do was actually abrade the surface to get rid of that ink. So very, very carefully scraping off the very top layer to get rid of the ink. So obviously we couldn't scrape it away where there's the ink goes over the the, the printing. Um, so you're still left with some remains, but uh, happy to say that we did get somewhat of a good result. Um, and I think his guilty conscience was was appeased. Now this one is um, as a bit of a rubbish um, photograph. It was actually very very difficult to photograph, but it's uh, it's a print by Banksy, and I do treat quite a lot of works that have a very high value. And um, this this is one of them. Banksy prints are are really rocketing up in the art market. Um, the chap who brought this in didn't actually own any other valuable works. Um, obviously, I do work for quite a lot of people who have a lot of valuable works and for dealers. Um, but this chap only owned this picture, and he took it off the wall because he was about to have the floor sanded in his house and so it was moving everything out and uh, and he dropped it and um, the glass broke and you you can't see probably because it is a bad picture but something like here there's a little cut um, and here you can see here are some close-ups of some of the damages there are actually a lot of little damages all over the surface from the broken glass so you know this this thing this it's worth around forty thousand um, pounds and obviously with damage it's worth pretty much nothing and uh, I mean happily i I don't have to worry about what things are worth um that's that's not for me. I just do my job and and people pay me and I give it back um, but with this one, I knew that if we could repair it so that damage was invisible, like it's always going to be damaged and it would always have to be declared when it was sold, but he could then sell it on for, for you know, a decent amount of money. So the after treatment um, photograph is actually taken by a professional photographer so that it could go onto a website to be sold. Um, and it, so the lighting looks very different to the before treatment. But we were able to work with the softness of the paper and manipulate the paper. So those little cuts were almost, almost impossible to see. So something very, very different. Um, but again, something that you know might be quite valuable. I, I've worked for quite a few banknote collectors um, and banknotes obviously have been handled a lot. This one's been mended with sellotape and got very stained, but we're quite limited sometimes in what we can do if the thing has been signed or written on um, by hand. And this one has got handwriting here and here in a brown ink, which is very soluble in water. So I couldn't wash it. And all I could do with this one was use a solvent to try and reduce the sellotape staining um, and then repair it and, and flatten it. This is also a banknote treatment, um, so on a different scale. So down here on these notes, which are sort of brand new, there was some sticky residue. They'd actually been stored in a um, a folder which had some adhesive to, to keep the two bits, the front and the back of the folder together, and it had become sticky. So here we we're able to remove that. And that obviously is, I was going to say, it's, it's not sort of um, an emotional thing for the owner, like the drawing of, of the woman's mother, but actually it's more of a valuable thing. But But of course, I think the two go together. So the guy was very, very pleased that I was able to treat this.
and stamps again um, value and collectors um, this this came in a whole massive number of penny reds um, and the as you can see on the right hand side the the penny reds had got folded over and sort of stuck to themselves and then the sheet had split along the perforations so it's much more valuable if there's no tears in the perforations and obviously if it's not stuck to itself. Um, so I, it was actually a very, very difficult treatment because I had to use moisture to separate the stamps out, but you can't reduce any of the adhesive on the back because that's valuable if, if it's intact. And as you use moisture, the stamps curve as they respond to the moisture and then they would easily rip along the perforation lines. So it was a very, very delicate treatment um, and uh, quite one I was quite glad to be over and done with. This is something very different. It's three dimensional. It is yeah, a model, a uh, stage model of um, Aladdin stage set. Um, and it's now on display in the V&A in Dundee. Uh, belongs to Edinburgh City Museums and uh, had suffered quite a lot of wear and tear over the years. Um, you can see sort of broken, delicate trellis work there, quite dirty, little bits falling off um, and scrapes and bumps. So uh, a lot of time was spent cleaning it um, again with this special latex sponge that we use and little damp swabs and a soft brush um, and there it is after treatment looking all shiny and uh, the scrapes were retouched um, and if you've been to the V&A in Dundee you may have seen it it's lit really beautifully so that that shiny stage looks looks really sort of sparkly um, this project um, belongs to a museum in Thurso, and it's a watercolour that suffered a, a lot of damage. And I've got quite a few slides to sort of talk you through the whole process of, of what I did to this picture. So it, the paper is mounted on a wooden stretcher, and you can actually just about see, I think, around the edges here where it's a bit less discolored where, where the wood um, is um, and then it's got puncture marks through it the paper's quite discolored and degraded um, and weakened by being degraded and it's been sort of pushed through like 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 a drum or something um, uh, this is the back of it so filthy dirty stuck onto that wood stretcher um, so first of all, I cleaned it and took quite a lot of dirt off it. Um, and then I had to take it off the wooden strainer and I used a steamer to do that. Happily for me, it released quite quickly. Um, there's the back of it off the wooden stretcher. Um, and then I washed it. So that top image is of the watercolour in the wash bath. Um, and then there it is dried after its washing, still with all the tears in it. And then I took it a bit further and I used the light bleaching lamp to bleach the sky area. Um, the, the rest of it is uh, shielded with some tin foil actually to keep the light off it. And then you can see that it's much, much brighter, but it's still got the tears in it. And then I lined it onto a sheet of Japanese paper and, and put it onto a board um, to keep it nice and taut. So in the top right, you can see there it is before treatment and underneath um, there it is after treatment. So a bit of a dramatic change. And the museum were incredibly pleased to have it treated. Um, it's the earliest depiction that they've got of their area. Um, so, so from historical point of view, it's it's really important. Um, this is uh, a work on tracing paper that was damaged in the first Glasgow School of Art fire. We, we do a lot of work for Glasgow School of Art, 
and uh, obviously after the fire um, there was quite a bit more than usual to be done um, and what's happened to the tracing paper is that it's not it's not burnt or singed or anything but a lot of the objects that were damaged of course got wet by um, firemen squirting hoses in and uh, so the tracing paper got wet and then it dried and it split because it's um, stuck down around the edges it, it was sort of under tension and it couldn't take the strain of being wet and then dry so it was in a right mess um, wasn't very dirty no soot or anything it had been covered up um, and I had to take it off the backing um, which, which was actually a really tricky job it was very very well stuck I washed the whole thing um, uh, I had to also treat the mount because that was original as well I had to line it and realign all the pieces and there it is before and after treatment and something happened which I predicted and I discussed with the curator um, but that is, I don't know if you can see that on the right hand picture after treatment, uh, the, the, um, pence, the tracing paper has actually shrunk and I've had to insert a sort of an inner mount in order to, to fit it into its original mount. So I know perfectly well that if you get tracing paper wet and then let it dry, it will shrink. That's you know that's something that if you know about different sorts of papers, you would be familiar with. Um, but there was no way that I could treat this without wetting it. I couldn't. I couldn't draw all the cracks back together. I couldn't flatten it. I couldn't reduce the discoloration. So I spoke with the curator and and said that this was an issue and it was going to happen. But you know we had to choose whether we rescued it or not and and happily she she was up for doing that here's a quirky one um 40 meters long document uh, um a whole bunch of signatures on a, a masonic petition this is my colleague anna treating it um this treatment was not so much about um doing surface cleaning and repairs, although there was some of that to be done, especially at the end, which had been most handled. But we also photographed it. So every single section was photographed. You can see the photographer standing there and two of us rolling the big roll through underneath his camera so he could capture each section. And then we made a box and we stored it really safely and labeled it and um, a CD is of all the images is here kept in the box and also went to um, the the Roslyn Trust who owns the the document um, so that if anybody wants to research it they don't have to unroll the whole jolly lot like Anna had to in order to treat it but they can go to um, the CD and, and just read it without undoing it and something quite different again. Um, I don't treat globes very often. There's actually a specialist in London who treats globes, but she was really overloaded. Um, and this one was local. And she said uh, that the client had asked her to treat it. And she said, maybe if I talk you through it, you, you could do it. So I said, yes. Um, um, so obviously a globe has got a, a paper surface, which is varnished, um, that's been adhered to plaster um which is on a an armature inside um so this one had got a big bash it had it had been i think bought at auction and in transit it had been bashed so in india um and what i had to do was face that whole area um onto tissue and take it off then we had to fill the area with plaster smooth it down um and put all the little smashed up pieces back together and, and realign it and do some retouching. Some wallpaper, very different again. This again is at Abbotsford, Chinese wallpaper at Abbotsford. 
um, where we spent two weeks, I think, a team of three of us, um, uh, just trying to reduce some of the stains on this wallpaper, which actually the only way we could do it was by covering up the staining using pastel pencils. So we couldn't remove the stains, but we just disguised them. So you can see here a, a before on the left and a after on the right. So just knocking back some of those dark areas. So, so the room is just a little bit more cohesive. And a very different wallpaper project. National Trust for Scotland own this little longhouse near Loch Tay. Um, and this is the sort of thing that we were faced with inside. Um, layers and layers and layers of wallpaper where the people obviously, uh, they must have had ac some cheap access to wallpaper um, and they just never took any down. They just pasted more on top. Um, and one of the times we visited to do site work here, the, this is a little box bed. And you can see um, here that the ceiling of the box bed was papered and there was so much paper on it that it had swung down um, and we were trying to put it back up. So this is Anna underneath here and me lying up on top and we're using a very ingenious system that we um, figured out to, to keep it back up. Um, but from Morlanic, we also were asked to make um, a panel which would display all the different layers of wallpaper. So one section wasn't put back on the wall, but it was brought to the studio. And here it is being soaked in a bath to separate all the layers. And here are the layers. Um, and this is Anna with all those different layers, mounting them onto a panel, which was then framed and is in the visitor center at Morlanic for people to see, which I think was a really good idea. And I'm really glad that the trust were able to spend the money to, to do that so that people got a sense of, of all those papers stuck one on top of the other. And we also made a little booklet. So this area was cut out it's, it's sort of quite small um, again all the layers were separated and each of them was put in into a little booklet like this um, so that you can leaf through and see all the different patterns that were used this is a project i think it's the last one i've got to show you um, which we still have the poster in the studio and it's really not finished yet, but we've done the majority of the work. It's, it's a large poster, as you can see, that's Anna standing next to it. Um, it belongs to the Royal Conservatoire in Glasgow and it's a poster um, advertising Levant, this, this Australian magician who toured uh, around Europe. Um, and apparently he was, he was really quite a character um, anyhow, the conservatoire have this poster and you can see that it's in really in a right mess. So all the constituent papers are beginning to detach. Um, there are some big losses in it and they really wanted it to look as good as possible. So what we did was take all the different sections off the board um, and they were each washed and then they were lined onto Japanese paper to, to give them strength. And here is Anna and myself. Um, the, we've lined the original board support with um, really good quality rag board. Um, and then each of the sections is being pasted up and pasted back on top. Bit of a jigsaw. So this is where we got to using all the pieces that we had originally. Um, and you can see that there are two major losses. There are lots of little tears and nicks out of it, but there are two areas which have got, you know, it's, yeah, major, major loss. And the conservatoire wanted those to be painted back in. So unfortunately, they were not able to supply us with an image of this said poster, um, if, you know, which wasn't damaged. 
they said the best they could do was that on the web, if you go to, if you Wikipedia um, entry on Levant had got this tiny reduced image of the poster. So at least it meant that we could see roughly what the picture was meant to be and what the writing says at the bottom. But it really wasn't good enough for us to do a sort of retouching replication of, of this poster. Um, but brilliantly, I was giving a talk to the Banknote Society of Scotland and one of the gentlemen in the audience came up to me afterwards and he said, I'm a member of the Magic Circle and I think I've seen an image of that poster, an undamaged poster, obviously. Um, and he said, if you'd like, I could email, put a notice up on the Magic Circle board and um, see if anybody has got good quality images that they could let you have. And that's what happened. So a magician in California sent us very high quality images of the areas that are missing. And at the moment, this, this is where we're up to, that um, another colleague of mine, Lisa, has been very carefully retouching, um, repainting in the areas that are missing. Um, so she's doing a really great job of it. I asked her to come. She's got a degree in illustration and I just felt that her quality of painting was going to be better than mine. So it's nice to be able to invite different people in who have different skills. That's the end of my talk. Um, so I hope I've given you plenty of things that have been of interest. Um, this is my email address and indeed our website address so if anybody wanted to look up and see other projects that are on the website they could and if you have any questions that um you you want to email to me then then that would be absolutely fine um but if you've got any questions right now i'm more than happy to answer them well thank you very much for that uh helen uh, fascinating absolutely fascinating and certainly gave me a, a huge insight into the into the type of work that you do um and the results were were really quite quite incredible um you obviously have a <coughs> particular set of skills and a and a, um, a very good dexterity to be able to to handle all these different artifacts so yes as helen has said um the um the email address was up there, but it's on the Scottish uh, Conservation Studios uh, website if you, if you didn't happen to, to get it. Um, and if anybody's got any questions just now, they could type it into the, to the chat box. So if you're okay, Helen, we'll just uh, give it a couple of minutes. Mm, if there's of any, course. anything pops up here. But... Uh, Yes, uh, one thing that's, um, that's popped up is, um, do you ever uh, handle photographs or is that a different area? Yeah, yes, yes. Um, I didn't put any photos in into the, um, the, the PowerPoint to show because quite often they, there's not such drama sort of before and after treatment. Um, yes, yeah, so typically the things that they might be torn and obviously I can repair them. And, and they get dirty and you can you can do some cleaning, um, but it tends not to be so dramatic that like you can't wash them or bleach them in the same way as you can with watercolors or prints. Um, and actually something that people do bring to us from time to time is photographs stuck to glass. So if a photograph has been in a frame directly against the glass and it's got wet, <coughs> the gelatin surface of the photograph becomes a glue you know you can solubilize gelatin with water so on really quite a few occasions people have phoned up and said i've got this photograph and it's stuck to glass can you take it off and sometimes yes and sometimes no um like it tends to be if it's not been stuck there for very long then I might be in luck, and and if it's been there for, you know, decades, then probably not. 
so yeah yeah we do treat photos um and it depends what's wrong with them but um so yeah sometimes you can you can fix the problem and and sometimes you can't yeah i could i could appreciate that um yes yeah, different techniques and in, involved there just um it, it's can... such a different it's quite a complicated structure really you know with a surface layer and an under layer in the paper um and then obviously the image it's yeah it, it chemically it's it's much more complicated and you have to tread very cautiously mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not that i'm not cautious with everything because i am <laughs> of course of course um so yeah here's the question what is the oldest object you have worked on well actually that's very easy for me to answer because i've treated papyrus documents um, from the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow. And papyrus um, obviously is, is really, really old. Um, so I think the oldest ones were around the third century BC. So that's, yeah, that sort of, you know, way outscores any other old thing. Um, you know, we, we've get letters in and documents that are like 1500s, 1600s, but, but, yeah, if you're really looking for the oldest thing, it's definitely papyrus. That um, must be quite, not just difficult, but um, <laughs> maybe inducing a bit of anxiety, uh, the fact that it's so, so old and, and, well, presumably valuable at the same time. Yeah, valuable, but things have value in, in different ways, you know. It's sort of, yes, it is, it's quite different, different things sort of... Um, yeah make make you feel more awe inspired like some we've had original poems written by robert burns you know like the original manuscript that sort of thing will come in and and you're ooh letter written by mary queen of scots it's you know it's, it's certain things just really make you stop i mean even after all these years of treating such lovely interesting things particular objects just really stop you in your tracks and you think oh my goodness mm, like this mm. is incredible the papyrus actually it's more <laughs> the case that it becomes very brittle and shatters into tiny tiny pieces which are just like such a jigsaw to put back together so actually sort of the problem in hand just completely takes over and you're just sort of totally engrossed in in doing the job that needs to be done so you know, there's not really any space for thinking oh my gosh it's third century bc it's just like oh my god which does it which way up does this bit go it's <laughs> yeah so it, so it becomes all cons consuming that yeah you know, indeed yes and the job at hand rather than necessarily thinking too much about what it is or where it's where it's come from it's just yes deal yeah yes um someone's asking how many layers of wallpaper there were at the at, at the long house oh yes and you know i meant to write this down and i can't remember i think it was about 36 <laughs> in one part in one part there was about 36 layers all together yeah crazy uh, <laughs> yeah um the inside uh, of that little room was sort of rounded it was like like a cave because there was no way that they could tuck the wallpaper into the corners anymore. There weren't really any corners. It was just sort of like a sort of rounded lozenge. <laughs> Did you think there was any element of thinking about insulation when they were doing it? I think so, definitely. Yes, yes. <laughs> and they needed it too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, what else is there here? So um, someone's asking about the text on the Levant poster oh yes i'm not sure if uh, just what was the text was it was was it just oh, uh, lord um something about how what's tricks or something I, I i couldn't tell you off the top of my head i'm afraid okay so kind of kind of coming in the wake of the how old um what is the most expensive object 
you've worked on? Yeah, the most valuable thing. Um, we we do sometimes treat things that are scary, scary valuable, and you know, there am I putting putting it in the wash bath. <laughs> it's, yeah, it does sort of draw you up tight sometimes. Um, the single most valuable thing was uh, a drawing by Lucian Freud um, that belongs to a private collector in Aberdeen. He bought it in at an auction in London. So we knew he'd paid 1.6 million for it. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, so that came to the studio and luckily it didn't need much doing to it. Um, and he came to get it. And I didn't want that hanging around, <laughs> really. It's yeah, but mm. I, I almost would really rather not know how much things are valued at, because it sort of gets in the way. Um, I, I remember having a, a turn of watercolor came in, and it was valued at, I think, eight hundred thousand, and it it was quite discolored, and. I I didn't wash it, and if it had been a watercolor by a you know a lesser known artist that didn't have that sort of value on it, I I would have done. So so it you know and would have done perfectly safely. Obviously I I wouldn't treat it if I hadn't gone through all the testing procedures that we do, but just knowing what the value was. It mm. it sort of inhibited w what I did to it, so I was really really minimal in in what I did, um, mm. and then it went out again. Yeah. Yes, uh, I hate to think of your insurance. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, we have we have really good professional indemnity insurance, mm. um, and then for fire and theft, pe people have to take out their own um, cover for that because we just couldn't afford to cover everything that was in the studio so uh, happily we have really really good security here because we're at Hopeton and we're covered by you know all the security that that the house has so we've got you know smoke alarms and intruder alarms and all that so mm. Mm. Uh, another question um have you ever had a moment while working on something when you when you thought, oh no, this is you know this is this isn't going to plan or or uh -huh. or what, perhaps? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Quite a few. <laughs> um, yes, yes. Um, like you know, to a different degree. Uh, I mean, very rarely is is there a sort of <gasps> moment, but you know, oftentimes there's a ah, it's not quite working out as I thought um you know things that we do lots and lots of testing and I have got you know however many 35 years of experience um but everything is different so and that's actually you know that's the interest in the job for me is that everything is different and there are continually little surprises so I think quite a good example is um, I was treating an etching by Ben Nicholson. I have treated actually quite a lot of Ben Nicholson prints. Um, I really like his work, and, and I, because I've managed to treat quite a lot now, I know how the paper responds. I, you know, I it, they're quite predictable. So I washed this etching, and etchings are very very stable in a water bath. But one tiny, tiny bit of a line, it was maybe five or six millimeters long on one of the lines when it was in the wash bath, started to bleed. And it must have been that the print had been slightly edited by hand. So after it had come through the printing press, somebody had maybe ben nicholson himself had reviewed it and thought oh no i'd like that line to be just a tiny bit longer and they'd put it in with ink by hand and it looked absolutely the same as the lines that were printed and that were very stable and there's no way that you would have picked that up by just looking at, at the print before treatment so it was in the bath and you know i, I walked past it Ooh, 
whoops, you know, there's a little, like, like a little sort of plume of smoke almost, you know, a sort of little whirl of black ink coming off this line. But it's fine. Like, I'm good at fixing things. So, you know, I, I know exactly what to do if, if that happens. But it's, yeah. Mm. Thing, mm -hmm. Things happen. But we, yeah, we're very, very careful the way we treat things. And also when things do happen that are unpredictable, we're really good at treating that situation as well. So it keeps us on our toes. Yes, but that, that, that speaks to your professionalism and your expertise and the years of experience, of course. Yes, yes. I mean, that's, that's not an overnight thing. That, that takes a lot of... Uh, no, no. And I, yes, I mean, I think now, you know, I've been treating things for so many years and, and I, I sort of wish that I could, you know, the things that I treated in my early career, I think, oh, I would be so much better at doing them now. But, yeah, it's, mm. yeah. Okay, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, yeah, so which restoration has given you the greatest satisfaction, would you say? Well, it's, it's sort of impossible to put your finger on on one, really. Um, I think perhaps sometimes it's, it's actually the small jobs which you can start to finish it's it's really it's all completed very quickly and it's those jobs like that pencil drawing of the child asleep was you know the the woman's mother it it was i knew that that i could make that look really good and i knew she was really upset about the damage that had happened so to be able to from my point of view it was actually quite a straightforward treatment um and i could make it look really good as new and i could give it back to somebody and say to them here you are it's it's all better um and she was you know absolutely delighted so so it's partly about doing a a, a really good treatment getting a great result but also you know, giving it to somebody and who's really going to appreciate it. I think that's that's sort of part of the satisfaction. That sort of sounds a bit twee, really, but it's absolutely true. Um, no, I think I could understand that because there's sort of the, the sort of the purely sort of professional side, you know, the stuff for the museums, for example. But then, as you say, the one that was the the the, the, the lady's mother obviously had had that sentimental value. Yes. Um, so even though it maybe wasn't valuable and 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 you know, in monetary terms, um, like you say, she was still you know very pleased to to have it yes. back and you know and restored again. So yeah, I can yes. understand that. Yes, and there are other jobs that are more complicated. I mean, like like the Morlanic Longhouse wallpaper. You know, it's a sort of crazy situation, and it's really sort of exciting and eye-opening to go in there and think oh my goodness you know look at this place and you know try and figure out what you can do to make it better and then if a client has the imagination and the funds to be able to do something like the National Trust of Scotland did on that project where we could make the panel to to display all the different papers and the booklet so that researchers could look at the papers the front and the back and you know, that's really, really satisfying to make something sort of more rounded that that you know will sort of have a long term benefit, you know, for, for a lot of people who are, are visiting that that property. That's really satisfying as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it must be. It must be. Um, well, there doesn't appear to be any other questions, so I think we'll just uh, probably wrap it up at, at that. And um just like to say thank you again, Helen, for your time. Oh, um, my pleasure. And um, as I say, fascinating insight. I'm sure everybody um, has learned quite a bit tonight to see, to see sort of behind the scenes because it's not something that you normally you know get the opportunity um, to see at all. So thank you again. Oh, uh, I'll just, thank uh, you for having me. 
I just wish everyone a, a good night and uh, hopefully see you at the next talk. Thank you. Thank you.